Good morning, everybody. My name is Wendy Gaffar, and I'm a specialist advisor for Ofsted. And I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today on the thematic review that we did entitled Feeling Heard, Partner Agencies Working Together to Make a Difference for Children with Mental Ill Health. I'd like to introduce you to my colleagues today. So first of all, Karen. Good morning, my name is Karen Collins-Beckett and I'm a Children's Services Inspector with the CQC and I'm the JTI lead for on behalf of CQC. And Yvonne? Good morning, everybody. My name is Yvonne McGuckian. I'm an inspector with HMI Probation with responsibility of inspection of youth offending services. And Simon. Good morning, everybody. My name is Simon Alexander. I'm an inspector with Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary. So the aims for today are to introduce and reflect on some of the key themes from the mental health joint targeted area inspections, and I'll go into some detail in a minute about those inspections. To hear the voices, reflections and experiences of children and young people that we spoke to during the review. To hear about some of the good practice that may be relevant to your current context, and also to pose you some questions for you to consider in your work. So the JTIs took place before the pandemic. So although all our findings predate the pandemic, we think they contain some valuable lessons in terms of the current context. So although much is still unknown about the longer term effects of the pandemic, evidence suggests that lockdown measures and ongoing restrictions alongside the pandemic are had, having a negative impact on many children's mental health and emotional well-being. And also we know that there are now serious concerns about children and young people's access to services. So, for example, um, recent evidence from an NHS provider survey show that 100% of mental health trust leaders said demand for their services had either significantly or moderately increased, and two thirds of trust leaders said they're not able to meet demands for CAM services. So, the current context is obviously really challenging. So, I'm just going to take you through for a couple of minutes what a joint targeted inspection is and what it looks like. So the, in, the joint inspections involve the full, full inspectorates who are here represented today. And we look across a range of services to identify how they respond to meet children's needs. And each year we, we choose a particular theme. So for example, we've looked at neglect, we've looked at domestic abuse and child exploitation. But this JTI was somewhat different. We focused on multi-agency responses to children's mental ill health. So we can't cover every aspect of children's mental health in these JTIs, um, nor look at all the services. But this is how we sort of configure the work, if you like. We look across the front door of a range of services, looking at their initial responses to children. We choose a cohort of children um, to look at what, what we call a sort of deep dive look at a group of children and for this JTI we looked at children aged between 10 and 15 who were on child in need child protection or who were looked after children and we look at leadership and management across those areas of work and we used our unique joint agency methodology to focus on how agencies work collaboratively with partners and we were interested in looking at good practice and also um, how partners are working to prevent deterioration and promote good mental health and well-being and of course we also looked at identifying gaps and what needs to improve so we think that these j ties although they've got a very particular focus do um, result in wider lessons that we hope you will find useful so what did we do for this j tie so we commissioned young minds to consult with young people and we also spoke to young people during inspection and we're really grateful to the valuable evidence that young people provided for us during these inspections. We completed a literature review and we analysed local and national data, we consulted with stakeholders and we inspected six local areas and the, the inspections took place between September 2019 and February 2020 so finished just before the pandemic. And we looked across a range of agencies, and you'll see those agencies now in front of you. Um, and I'm just going to 
mention the health services we looked at. You can see that we looked at a lot of different agencies. We also um, looked at the work of the voluntary and community sector. But in terms of health services, we looked at GPs, emergency departments in hospitals, school nursing, CAMs, young people's substance misuse services, looked after, after children's specialist health team. So a lot of health services were looked at. So today we're going to use some case studies as we go through our findings. We've changed the details of those cases and obviously we've changed children's names so children can't be identified. And also when we use the term children throughout this presentation, we're including young people in that definition. It's not likely we're going to have time for questions at the end of today, but if you do have questions you want to ask us, please put them in the chat. If we have time, we will answer today or we will come back to you. And we'd really encourage you to read the full report because obviously we cannot cover everything today. So the first, first thing we're going to look at is early identification and building trust with children. So I'm sure you're all aware it's really important that children's mental health needs are recognised and responded to early. Providing support at the right time can mean those problem, problems don't escalate and also can um, reduce the risk of the longer term impact on the child. And we know from young minds that it's really important to young people that their needs are recognised and responded to early. What they told us was if they get the right response initially, they're far more likely to ask for help in the future. And this is a quote from a young person um, that we spoke to. So early intervention is needed to stop issues getting worse. And if children don't get that response, ultimately it leads to people using services for longer because their issues get worse and worse. Um, so professionals therefore need to recognize early when there's a concern about a child, but understand also that behaviors can be an indication of mental, mental ill health and not wait for the child to have to speak out about those issues. And this is another quote from a child that I'll just let you read through. Can we have, thank you. So what we found in our inspections that was professionals across many agencies have opportunities to identify children with mental ill health and ensure they get the support that they need. However, there was too much variation across local areas and areas need to do much more to drive up that consistent, effective response to children so that they're identifying children's needs at the earliest opportunity. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Yvonne, who's going to talk to us about our findings from inspecting youth offending teams. Yvonne? Hi Wendy, Yvonne seems to have dipped out. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll take us through this section. Um, so we, we were hoping to have Yvonne to talk to us about youth offending teens, but I will continue. So, um, we looked at how youth offending teams were working with children to identify any mental health needs at the earliest possible point. And youth offending teams are often, often start their assessments in the knowledge that children have faced trauma or have had adverse childhood experiences. And this is a common uh, feature of children who they work with. This meant that youth offending team workers were often already alert to the possibility of mental ill health in children. And we found some very positive examples of detailed and comprehensive assessments. And these collated a lot of information, which was then used by the youth offending team to plan how to best help and support the child. And in these good assessments, youth offending staff were able to make the connections between trauma, mental health, and the behaviors that led to offending. These teams were also good at helping other professionals understand the impact of trauma on the child's mental health and emotional well-being and how this could affect their behaviour and interactions with other people. We know that 
poor communication is also a mental health risk factor and children with speech, language and communication needs are at increased risk of developing mental health problems. Yacht workers were good at engaging children, building trusting relationships quickly. Through discussions with children, yacht workers were able to identify potential problems of the child's ability to communicate. Where yachts had early access to specialist assessments, including speech and language therapists and mental health services, we found that these were fundamental in helping all professionals understand how best to work with the child. And the following is a good example of this. So Jude was a 14 year old who'd experienced multiple adverse um, childhood experiences. She was now in care and she was living with mental ill health. And she'd recently had a speech and language assessment in the yacht. And the findings from this were informing all of those professionals who were working with her as to how best to communicate with her. And importantly, this helped them to gain her views. So there were specific su subtleties in relation to her speech and language needs that had not previously been understood. And professionals said that her communication needs had her communication needs been better understood at an earlier stage, then interventions to support her may have been more successful. So this is a really powerful illustration of the importance of children getting all of their needs assessed at an early stage. A limited ability to communicate and understand, of course, will impact on all aspects of a child's life, including their ability to engage with the outside world, their education and their mental health. However, for many children, we found that the first time they received an assessment of their speech and language need was when they accessed a yacht service. And it's concerning that children have to wait until they become known to the criminal justice system before this is addressed. So in the best examples that we saw in yachts, their assessments were based on an informed understanding of the links between childhood experiences such as abuse, neglect, exploitation and mental health and offending behaviour but good practice in yachts was not universal. In one area, we found that yacht assessments did not always address children's mental health or make the connection between children's experience of abuse and neglect, their mental health and wellbeing, and their offending behaviour. So, Simon, we also find wide variation in how the police respond to ch children with mental ill health. I'll now hand over to Simon. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yes, we did find a, a variation in, in the response, a uh, mixed picture, but some really good examples. So at a point of crisis in a child's life, it is important that professionals, including police officers and police staff, have the right support to identify when a child may be suffering mental Ill health. Professionals then need prompt access to specialists who can access the child's needs and ensure that children get the help they need. We found this worked well for children, where there was effective joint working between agencies. For children being arrested for criminal offences and placed in police custody can be an extremely stressful and anxious situation. This is particularly the case for those children who suffer from mental health. In most areas we inspected, we found that children who are detained in custody are supported through timely identification of their mental health needs by the Liaison and Diversion Service. That service identifies people who may have mental health needs, learning disabilities, substance misuse or other vulnerabilities when they first come into contact with the criminal justice system as suspects, defendants or offenders. And the availability of these professionals in this setting is helping children experiencing mental Ill health by supporting them through the early stage of the criminal system pathway, referring them for appropriate health or social care support, or enabling them to be diverted into a more appropriate setting if required. In areas where the service worked effectively, we found that children's needs are assessed and assessments are then promptly shared with relevant agencies so that children get the right support. In one area, we found that police complete background checks on all children coming into custody, including on whether children have a history of mental health. And this type of screening process helps the police to understand the child's background and any support they may need whilst being detained. It also informs the risk assessment and helps to determine how best to manage the child's welfare while in custody and also means that the child can be referred on for help or signposted to appropriate services. In another area, there were specialist trained officers known as autism, autism ambassadors who acted as points of contact for police officers and staff to access advice and guidance. 
and this enabled better recognition response to children with autism. In a further area, there was a police team who were working with mental health trusts to identify high intensity service users to ensure they had the right care with agreed response plans with joint working for when the police attended an incident involving them. We did not find this everywhere. In two areas, it was clear that police staff in the custody suite had not had sufficient training on the importance of identifying children's mental health needs when they are brought into or held in custody. Significantly, this means that while in other areas, children coming into custody have who have mental health needs may benefit from an assessment and referral. In these areas, that opportunity could be missed. It also means that information that could be used to inform multi-agency intervention and prevention is not shared and used for the analysis of risk and need. We'll show you one example regarding this. Elliot, uh, who was arrested and brought into custody, uh, was under the influence of drugs and hearing voices and he told the police that he was using drugs to numb the pain. Police did consider whether they needed to share that information with other agencies but decided that wasn't necessary. Elliot was kept in custody overnight and did not see an appropriate adult for a long time. Clearly this was a child with mental health needs that should have been considered as soon as they came into the police custody and that lack of recognition meant that he didn't receive the necessary support as a child in need of help. When a police attend incidents where children may be present, again, it's important they get the right response and joint work between the police and health services in some areas mean that this is happening as it should do. In these areas, the police have invested in a mental health triage system with specialist mental health nurses attending incidents with the police that could involve adults or children who may have mental health. The result of this, it enables a prompt assessment to be carried out and the specialist nurse can offer immediate advice and police officers told us that they are increasingly feeling confident about responding to children and young people with mental health due to this arrangement. It's also reduced the occasions in which the police have used one section 136 of the Mental Health Act. However, arrangements like these are not available in all areas. And in one area, that service was only available to children over the age of 16 and adults with mental health issues. I'll now hand you over to Wendy to talk about the school's responses. Thank you, Simon. So the children that we surveyed for our in, uh, through Young Minds reported that the place they were most likely to access support or to seek support was their school. So I'll just let you read this quote from one of the children that uh, Young Minds spoke to. And this was one of the quotes that really had an impact on me because I think it really showed the difference that one professional can make to a child. And it shows that this teacher was alert to all the children in his class and recognized there was a child here that was, was suffering and having difficulty. And I particularly like the fact that the teacher kept checking back in with the child. So the child knew that that teacher was keeping him in mind. And clearly from what the child says, this made a real difference to, to him. But in order to do this, what we found, which is um, clearly evident, is that schools need support from other agencies. They cannot do this alone. Um, I'm going to take you on now to another quote from a child um, in relation to their experience in school. So again, I think we see a really nice example here where a, a teacher has taken a considered approach. They've gone at a really nice pace for the young person and they've given the young person some agency, so time to think about what they want included in that referral. So we see in both of these examples how individual teachers can make a significant difference to children. But as we said, schools can't do this alone. They need that support, a wraparound support from other agencies. And I'm now going to take you on to some examples of the type of support, positive examples of the type of support we saw. So in one area, we saw that the multi-agency partners had developed what they called a team around the school and a team around the professional. So this was a model that was aimed at building awareness, understanding in professionals about children's mental ill health. 
and it was a way of building capacity in the system. We know that the current system is really stretched and it's really important to build capacity in the system. So in this model, individual workers and individual schools had advice and support from specialist services like educational psychologists, CAMs, outreach services and safeguarding professionals. And then what we could see was that this made a difference to children. We could see that children were being identified or their needs were being identified more quickly. And they were getting support either in the school or from a professional. But identifying children's mental health needs in school is dependent, of course, on children attending school. In one area, again, we saw a really positive piece of work where they had the partners, this was partners working together, had developed an assessment tool for schools around um, increasing and promoting children's attendance. And a strong feature of this tool was focusing on emotional health and well-being. So that included training staff, consulting with pupils, having a named lead for emotional well-being and making sure that children and staff were clear where they needed to go, who they needed to contact if they had a concern about a child's emotional well-being or their mental health. And the standards that they had within this tool aligned with what uh, we were told by children in the Young Minds consultation was important to them. In a different area, we found that schools were supported well by the local authority and health providers. They had a school advisor for mental health support who developed networks of, of uh, schools, provided training, newsletters, guidance and a mental health audit tool. So this is just some of these are just some of the examples of very positive work that we saw. But Karen, we found a mixed picture in terms of school nursing. I'll now hand over to Karen. Thanks, Wendy. That's right. School nurses, we know, can play an important role in identifying children's emotional well-being and mental health needs. In our previous JTIs, we found wide variation in the level of service that children receive from school nurses, and this JTI was no different. Often, school nursing services are limited due to a lack of capacity, and in half the areas that we visited this time round, school nurses' health assessments didn't consistently or sufficiently address the emotional well-being and mental health needs of children. This was a lost opportunity to identify children's needs early. When school nurses had limited capacity to work with children, we found that they sometimes focused on the presenting issue rather than showing professional curiosity and delving deeper to understand the causes of children's problems and identify any potential mental health needs. In one area, however, the service included a specialist emotional health and well-being nurse who supported early identification of children's needs. School nurses used a questionnaire to allow children to rate their own emotional well-being, thereby helping them to feel fully involved in the assessment. It was also a real strength that two areas were providing an outreach school nursing service to home educated children to identify and respond to their mental health needs. Thinking about different health providers now so in emergency departments and GPs, it's our expectation that children attending hospital emergency departments should routinely receive a holistic assessment, including of their emotional well-being and mental health. It was disappointing, though, to find that this was not the case in all areas. We saw examples where one child attended a hospital as a result of having self-harmed and another child who had punched a wall and damaged their hand. A child attending in these circumstances provides an opportunity for professionals to show curiosity, look beyond the presenting issues and ask questions about the child's emotional well-being and their mental health. This was not found to be routine across the emergency departments that we visited. We identified similar concerns in primary care. We found that GPs generally did respond effectively to children who obviously had mental ill health. However, when this was less evident, GPs did not always ask the right questions in, in order to explore the potential risks to children's mental health. Given that the children in the Young Minds consultation highlighted GPs as one of the main professionals who they would seek help from, this was a significant finding. The young people in the consultation explained that a lot of young people do tell their GP about mental health, 
but they said that they are quite dismissive of such concerns. When GPs do take a child's mental health concerns seriously, they can make a significant difference, as we heard from one, per one person. The GP was the most helpful. It was the first time I was fully able to express what was happening and the other person understanding that completely. And we'll now hear again from Wendy about the real role of children's social care. Thank you, Karen. Um, we found that the front door of children's services were not always effective in identifying the mental he health needs of children who were referred to them early enough. This meant that initial decisions about children could be based on partial information without professionals being aware of all of the needs of the child. So in only half of the areas we inspected did we find that children's social care contacted CAMS to see if the child was known to the service, for example, or gather information from CAMS when they knew that a child was receiving support for, from them. In one area we visited, there was a CAMS worker in the front door of children's social care. And even though they only were there for one day a week, we did see that this made a significant difference. We, see, we saw a much better and more consistent focus on children's emotional health and well-being at that early stage and better liaison between agencies to seek and consider the information. We saw, as you might expect, that where referrers had included information in the referral about the child's mental health or emotional well-being, social workers were much more focused on this issue. But where that information was absent, there was less consideration of those issues. So this emphasises two points, really. The importance of referrals, including all of the relevant information about a child when they make a referral to children's social care, but also for social workers on the front line to consistently be asking the right questions about children's emotional health and well-being, so that all of the needs of the child are considered at that very early stage. Now, I'm hoping that Yvonne has managed to rejoin us and that I can hand over to Yvonne uh, for the next section. Hello, Yvonne. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Sorry for, the, sorry for that. Um, I'm going to talk you through now what children told us that helped them feel engaged and supported. So we want you to hear their views about what good engagement and support look like, focusing on schools and then joint working initiatives that we found to work well, but also some of those gaps in joined up services. Children told us about the qualities and approaches that they need from professionals so that they feel comfortable to talk about their mental health needs. They spoke about the need for a non-judgmental response from professionals, such as being accepted, being accepting of what children are saying and not being patronising or condescending. Being taken seriously was really important. Children also told us that professionals being available and giving them a safe space to open up was vital for them to feel comfortable to talk about their mental health. They spoke about the significance of a trusted professional being there no matter what and giving them time, space and attention. They stressed this point. They needed time to build up confidence. So what didn't help? Some children spoke about the difficult experiences they'd had when discussing their mental health. One said, as soon as my problems were put down to being a teenager, I felt unable to talk about them. Children with mental ill health who've experienced abuse and trauma may find it particularly difficult to, to build trusting relationships with professionals. Some had been too frequently let down. For this group of children, it was particularly important that they are helped to build trusting relationships with professionals. The qualities they outlined are all crucial, but so too is establishing trust, meaning that all the usual professional boundaries are in place and that the child is clear about the role of the professional, what support they can provide, and when professionals might need to bring other people in to help. The behaviour and approach of the professional who the child encounters can be highly significant in whether the child will feel safe to open up and to accept help. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about 
the role of trusted adults in schools and the wider roles that schools play. Children told us that their relationship in school was really important to them, with members of staff who'd taken time to know them, to know them well and understand their needs. We've got an example of this, and the example is about Sophie. The strongest advocate for Sophie was her school. School staff knew her, they knew her family and her background, and crucially, she trusted them. She'd experienced a traumatic life event that had led to changes in her life. And this was a time when she was in desperate need for an advocate. The school's designated safeguarding lead took that role and developed a strong working relationship with both CAMS and children's social care. This ensured that there was a coordinated package of care around Sophie that addressed all her needs. The impact of her childhood experiences was well considered. Her wishes and feelings were recorded clearly and her needs were considered holistically. As a result, she was able to maintain her attendance at school and make appropriate progress whilst accessing the support she needed with her mental health. But we found cases where this help is not in place for children and where their needs are not recognised and understood. As one child told us, my school did not communicate very well. It seemed impossible to get them to listen and they didn't support me with my mental health. They lost letters and never listened to CAMS. So when it worked well, what were the elements that needed to be in place? Wendy's now going to talk us through this. Thank, thank you, Yvonne. So I'm going to talk about uh, what we found worked particularly well in terms of inclusive, what we're calling inclusive practice by schools. So we found that schools that showed flexibility and understanding towards children and their mental health needs had the following features. They had a flexible environment. So they recognised the importance of children being able to establish really good relationship with staff and remain in education because obviously we want all children to reach their full potential. They provided an element of outreach work. So they would go out to the child's home. They would spend time with the child and the family in their home. Um, they were able to adapt their behavioural approaches to support children with particular mental health needs. And they were able to make changes, often short term changes to the curriculum, which we saw enable children to engage with schools. So I'm going to give a, a case illustration now, which I think illustrates this really well. So Lee had experienced difficulty in attending school. He, he'd got really serious mental health problems, but he did have within the school, he had very good relationships with staff and they supported him and they'd worked really hard to understand then his particular needs. And what they were able to do was adapt their approach, particularly to the management of behaviour to support him. And they recognised that because of his mental health, he couldn't comply with a standard behaviour policy. So you begin to see how the, for this child, there could have been a very different trajectory if he was in a school that was less flexible. So they worked with him to develop a personalised personalized curriculum. They recognised that he had a particular interest in music and they focused on that as a way of re-engaging him with school and helping him to uh, express himself. And we were able to see the real benefit with uh, significant uh, improvement in attendance at school, he was building his confidence and the school were really confident that he would work towards engaging again with all aspects of school. So children in the Young Mind survey as well told us how important it was to them that schools supported them when they were having to access mental health services. So for example giving them time off for appointments and continuing to support them when they wait for services. But again, this wasn't in place in all schools. And one child spoke of feeling abandoned once the referral was made to CAMS by the school, as if the school had acted as if they'd done everything now and didn't need to provide that ongoing support. We also found that for around a quarter of the children we reviewed, they either weren't attending school regularly or they didn't have a full time school place. 
and obviously this meant that staff might not be aware of all of the child's circumstances and the child might miss out on uh, support that was available within a school or an education environment. And we also found significant delays for children who'd either been excluded or had moved house and needed to find a new school. And we were really concerned about that because we felt that impacted on a child's uh, mental health, but also meant, of course, they didn't have access to education. So I'm now going to move on and talk in a bit more detail about flexibility in other services that we reviewed. So as you'll be aware, not all children feel able or want to access mainstream services at their point of delivery. And that can be because they, they don't know what's on offer. They don't know who the professionals are going to be. There's a lack of trust or they're suffering anxiety. So we saw real benefits for children where professionals were, were providing direct access to specialist support in different venues or adapting their arrangements to meet the very specific needs of the child. And the following case studies illustrate the effectiveness of this approach. So the first case study involves um, a child that we've called Maxine and she had a serious eating disorder and she needed to see her paediatrician and her dietitian regularly. But they recognised that because of her mental ill health, it was making it really difficult for her to attend those appointments. And so what they did is they undertook joint visits they worked together very closely. They built a good relationship with the family and with her by visiting her at home. She also had good relationship with staff in her school who played an important part in this work. And so we saw here some flexibility, which might sound like a really obvious thing to happen, but unfortunately it doesn't happen for all children, but made a real difference for Maxine being able to access the help that she needed. And likewise for Sean, the child in the next case study, he had um, primary health care and specialist health services working with him in relation to his physical and mental health. Again, this was a child where there were very high levels of concern about both aspects of his health. Um, they recognised that he wasn't engaging with professionals and some of that was in relation to his mental ill health. So again, we saw visits, sometimes single visits from a GP specialist health worker, sometimes joint visits with CAMS, so that he could get to know staff in an environment where he felt safe and secure. And he could begin to build confidence in those that wanted to support him. Um, many children, as we said, have to wait for a service and understandably struggle with these waiting times. And children, highlighted in the consultation that we did the importance of professionals maintaining contact with them when they have to await a service. And they told us that they really value phone calls, emails, advice, um, uh, being signposted to resources, for example, while they're waiting, and that that made them feel less alone. So I think that's another really important lesson from this JTI. We also saw some really good ways that um, uh, that services had sought to re-engage children when children had left a service. So one example of this was um, a CAM service that had worked with professionals who knew the child to identify what they called a change agent. So this change agent could be a member of a family, it could be a family friend, it could be a professional. The important thing was that it was one adult that the child trusted. And then the change agent would work with CAMS, visit the child in their home and try to talk to them, support them to re-engage with the service. Sadly, we've given, you, we've given you some good practice examples, but sadly, as I'm sure you're aware, not all children get this response. And we were really concerned that we found a number of examples where children had clearly expressed their high levels of distress and anxiety that should have clearly indicated to professionals that these children had mental health needs, but the mental health needs were not recognized and understood by professionals. And this, this occurred in, even in situations where there were, there were large numbers of professionals working with a child. All of these children had highly complex needs and had experienced real adversity in their young lives. So it was really important that they got the help they needed, but it sometimes seemed that the complexity that the child was experiencing 
overwhelmed the professionals and they weren't focusing on listening to the voice of the child. So what this meant was the child's needs for professional help and support was not in place. Um, professionals need really good supervision and management oversight. They need to challenge each other when they're working with children if they feel that a child has a mental health need and it's not being addressed. And as one child put it to us when asked by the inspector who cared for her, she replied that she did and that she could not trust anyone else to do so. And this was a child who had numerous professionals working with her. I'll now hand over to Karen, who's going to take us through section three of the webinar. Thanks, Wendy. We know that there are many barriers that children face in accessing support for their mental health, and these have definitely been exacerbated by the pandemic. Some of the barriers that we identified during these JTIs included confusing and complex pathways, lack of publicity about how and where to access help, professionals not recognising or identifying children's needs, and professionals not being clear about where to refer children onto once the needs have been identified. We found that positive changes were beginning to happen, but all areas were at different stages. And in the areas where children had the easiest access to services, we found that that was largely down to better joint working, structural changes to the way that these services were developed and much stronger support for professionals. These areas had moved away from CAMS being viewed as the only service suitable for children with a mental health need. Rather than CAMS accepting or rejecting referrals according to arbitrary thresholds, they delivered more integrated systems where CAMS reached out to other agencies, services and professionals to develop staff knowledge and awareness of me children's mental health, as well as providing direct services for some children. Not all areas had improved their access though. We found that waiting times for CAMS treatment in some areas remained far too long, especially for children with autism and or ADHD. Frontline professionals working with children are not all and cannot expected to be mental health specialists, but they do have an important role to play in meeting the needs of children. To be able to do this effectively, they need support from specialist services, such as access to help and advice and guidance, um, clearer pathways and referral processes, and a better understanding of the services that are available. The strongest areas had a single point of access, which was much more than just a central referral point. Professionals could seek advice and support. It worked best where triage assessments were completed with children by the single point of access practitioner with onward referral where appropriate. This approach shifted the emphasis away from professionals thinking that CAMS was the only option for children. It widened the scope of services available and as a result, it meant that children were assessed and had their needs met much sooner. In one area, there was an open drop-in service for, for young pe people aged 14 to 25 years. They could walk into the service for help with their emotional well-being, which was just one part of a much wider system of support. The restructuring of CAMS to provide outreach, as well as support to parents and professionals, meant that there was more capacity in the system to meet children's needs. This flexibility made a difference to children, parents and professionals and meant that there was a wider network of support for children with mental health needs. I'm now going to share some of the effective ways of working that we found, followed by some of the areas for improvement. So starting with some strengths. The first strength that we found was where CAMS provided a telephone consultation service for professionals. It was highly valued and gave staff an increased confidence in supporting children. Another was where CAMS offered individualised advice and support for parents and carers. They could better help and support, they could then better help and support and care for their child. It was particularly helpful when it was the wrong time for the child to engage with CAMS due to trauma or due to the circumstances that they were living in. As you can see on the screen, 
an example of such support was regarding Darren. Darren was a looked after child who was not able to access specialist CAM support at the time of assessment because he was not yet settled in his foster placement. The CAMS team agreed to work with Darren's carers to help them understand and better meet his needs. As his foster carers were better equipped to meet his needs, this enabled him to feel more secure and settled more quickly and therefore ready to access specialist therapeutic intervention. Unfortunately, though, this type of support was definitely not available in all the areas that we visited. CAMS providing specialist services to children at a time of crisis was, a, was another strength. So in one area we, where children presented at acute hospitals in mental health crisis, the CAMS outreach team provided a timely response and all children were seen within 24 hours. The CAMS outreach practitioner helped hospital ward staff to begin an assessment as soon as the child was well enough and this meant that intervention was offered and at, at an appropriate time for the child. In another area the liaison in and intensive support team within CAMS operated 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to provide intervention at the point of crisis. This service was therefore responsive and available to children attending the ED at any time of the day or night and staff could call on the service if they were concerned about a child. It was disappointing however that this 24 hour response was not available in all areas. Moving on to some of the areas for improvement that we identified. So we, we, there are still significant delays in accessing the right support. We've already spoken of the considerable concern about access to services for children and the impact of the pandemic. We found too many delays in some areas we visited and there is a considerable concern that the situation is likely to have worsened. There is some interesting learning from what children told us particularly when we consider the current context. They told us how important it is for them to get some, some type of support whilst waiting for specialist intervention. One child suggested having a scheduled phone call with someone because waiting was just awful. Other approaches that children have found helpful included advice, information and links to support such as online services. They also reported that being recommended self-help strategies would be helpful. Another area for improvement that remains was a lack of directory of services. None of the areas that we visited had a comprehensive directory of services and GPs told us that they did not always know what was available other than CAMS. How then can children and their families be expected to know what is available to them? This was a real concern. Before handing over to Simon, I wanted to finish with a short quote from one young person. Make sure that young people know where to go to try to make accessing support as easy and as stress-free as possible. Now, thanks over to Simon. Thanks, Karen. I'm now gonna talk about the strategic partnership responses. What is clear from our inspections is that children's mental Ill health will not be addressed through a single agency response. Safeguarding partners need to come together at a strategic level, alongside those who use the service to develop a joined up and coherent approach, ensuring that the services are delivered in an integrated way. We saw in many areas, strategic initiatives that were beginning to make a change for children involve partners working jointly and imaginatively to improve responses to children. Specifically, a thorough understanding of the local needs, being, that being used to inform a joint approach in developing clear priorities and the commissioning of services, and a wider engagement with a range of partners, including education and the voluntary sector. Whilst we found that in the six areas we visited were at different stages of progress, all areas do need to evaluate the effectiveness of mental health treatment for children more comprehensively, including the quality of service provision. Connected to service provision, it is essential to build a skilled workforce across and within agencies to have a shared understanding of how to identify children who may have mental health needs and where to get advice and how to access help for them. We found that there is an urgent need for local areas to review the extent and quality of training that professionals receive. 
Not all frontline staff are given the training they need to identify children at risk of mental health. With limited funding and increasing demand, especially in light of the recent and ongoing pandemic, it is essential that investment decisions are based on a good understanding of local need to support innovation and achieve the best outcomes for children. The role of the Health and Wellbeing Board and multi-agency arrangements can be significant and they should be powerful agents in supporting good understanding of the needs of the local population of children. This can underpin a well-planned response and targeted investment through the Joint Strategic Needs Assessment, Intelligence from Public Health, the National Health Service, Police and other forms of consultation with children. We would expect and did see in some areas the Health and Wellbeing Board holding the partners to account and developing clear priorities and clear direction. Essential for this to work was a thorough and wide reaching consultation to understand the local needs of children. And while we saw some good examples of this in all areas, more work was needed to identify the specific needs of different and diverse groups of children. So these could be integrated into planning and there needs to be a better and a specific, specific focus on children who have increased risk of mental health. More needs to be done to understand the needs of children from different ethnic backgrounds. We found some poor practice in respect of this. For example, a lack of understanding and focus on mental health needs of asylum seeking children and staff openly stating they're not having any training to help them with this. Where multi-agency arrangements worked well was where there was a joint and shared vision to address children's mental health within the partnership, wide representation, including statutory and non-statutory organisations, clear and coherent plans to develop services, shared model of working, early intervention and preventative strategies, effective engagement with schools, engagement with the voluntary and community sector, and a clear strategy which involves service users in the design and development of services. There is also a need for partnerships to be nimble and alert to changing patterns and trends in the local population so they can pool resources and respond quickly when new problems arise that impact on children's mental health. Again, this is not in place in all areas. In one area, the police and education providers were not involved in decisions about which services were to be commissioned for children with mental health needs. This reduced the opportunities to share information and reduced capacity to work together to pool resources and jointly develop services. Engaging with the voluntary and community sector at a strategic level makes a real difference. And in some areas, this was embedded and working well. The result, more integrated and comprehensive model provision, better understanding of local need, sector that can provide valuable local knowledge about different communities, and some groups were more likely to accept help from this sector, which therefore builds capacity within the system. When that wasn't in place, planning across the services was not coordinated, leaving the sector feeling isolated. The voluntary community sector were not aware of services and therefore could not refer children on. And children and families were also not aware of what was available. Again, we've talked a lot about schools. In all areas we visited, we saw strong and effective work strategically to engage with schools and a recognition of their role in identifying risk early and in providing preventative support. And what we say would say is really important is involving children in the development of services, listening to and understanding those experiences. And this can result in the delivery of better quality services and be more responsive to individual needs. And co-production of services with groups of children and young people helps them feel more independent and in control and gives them a sense of shared ownership of those services. All areas were at different stages of this work, and this needs more focus and attention. The children we consulted with, with had such valuable views and experiences to share that could be built upon to improve service provision. I'll now hand over to Wendy. Thank you, Simon. So we're just going to take you through some concluding remarks and, and leave you with some questions today. Again, we would encourage you to read the full report. You'll see we covered a lot of ground and there's much more detail in the report. But in terms of conclusions, we saw that building capacity in the system through joint working with mental health specialists and those professionals that work with children is really important. So we're, we're in a place where we need much more capacity in the system that's only going to happen through joint work. 
<coughs> excuse me, as we said, a single point of contact for advice for professionals and where professionals can re refer children for support was seen to make a real difference for children being able to access the support that they needed at the right time. This wide engagement across partners, so that's across health, children, social care, the police, education, voluntary and community sector, etc. But, and this comprehensive assessment of the needs of all of the children in the local community needs to inform the commissioning of services. And we've highlighted today where we identified some gaps. Areas need to develop a directory of services for children. This is really important. How can children access help if they don't know what's out there? And the response to children when they first speak out about mental health, you've heard from children today about how important that is, but staff need the training to enable them to have the confidence and the ability to respond appropriately. And as we know, too many children, we've been saying this for many years, too many children have to wait too long for a service. Some health professionals are not asking the right questions and they're focusing too much on presenting, op presenting issues and this is a lost opportunity. Schools need support from partners so that they can provide the support for children. This is really important around prevention and ensuring early identification. We've given you some good uh, examples today of how that can work well. And police forces need to share good practice. We saw real variation in police forces. We saw some really excellent practice and we saw, saw some much poorer practice. That good practice needs to be shared to drive improvements so that all children get the response that they need and deserve. So finally, I'm going to leave you with some questions for you to take into your organisations. So first of all, how do children and families in your local area know about what services are available? They need to be asked because we were told by strategic leads that this information was available. When we talked to children and families, it was clear children and families were not aware of that information. Is there a good understanding of the needs of children with mental health, mental ill health in your area, including children at risk from health inequalities? This is particularly important in the context of the pandemic. Do you or your staff have access to training on children's mental health and to a single point of contact for advice and support? As we said, staff on the front line cannot all be mental health specialists. It's about developing structures and systems so that they can get the advice and support they need when they need it. And finally, is there good joint working between mental health specialists and professionals working with children in your area? Does your local area consult with and involve children in the development of services? And finally, how do you provide a safe space for children to speak out, especially since COVID-19 has emerged? So I'd like to thank you for your um, attendance today and for listening to us. We recognize that we've provided you with a lot of information today. We hope that it is of value and of interest, and we really encourage you to read the full report. Please do send any questions uh, through. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions today, but we would like to thank you and wish you well for the rest of the day. Thank you and goodbye.